Hey everybody, welcome back to part two of a crash course in machine learning. Today we're going to talk about supervised learning. As you learned in part one, supervised learning is perfect when you know the ground truth labels for some set of training data. This can be used for continuous or discrete variables. So for instance, if you want to predict home prices or if you want to predict whether or not a tumor is cancerous, you can use uh, supervised learning in both of those cases. Typically, since we know the ground state truth label for our training data, we can associate a cost with the deviation of our model output from that known label. This allows us to navigate parameter space to minimize that cost. What I mean by parameter space is a higher dimensional space composed of the parameters of your model. One of the simplest cases is linear regression. Here on the top left I have shown a one dimensional problem which is uh, simply a y equal wx situation. The red points are our training data and the solid line is the model fit. In other words, that is what the model predicts for some arbitrary x. And of course this has only one parameter, w, and in this case it is a scalar. For clarity I've shown a dotted line which is just our initial somewhat random guess. So in this case the cost is proportional to the sum of the squares of the deviation of our prediction from our actual ground truth labels. So you see that the further away from the actual data points we are, the higher the cost. In fact, it's proportional to the square. So it doesn't matter if we're above or below the actual data. It's just going to be a positive number. So cost is a positive quantity. And of course, that gives you some complex shape, which happens to be a parabola in parameter space. In this case, just x. And in the vertical axis, we have the cost. And so it's a parabolic function in parameter space. And the idea here is that as the model evolves, we want to roll down the hill to where the cost is a minimum. And we do this through a technique called gradient and descent. So if you draw the gradient, in other words, the slope of this cost function at any given point, it tells you which way you want to step in parameter space to reach that minimum. And when you get down here to where the cost is the minimum value, the derivative or the slope is just zero. And so your model will stay there. And so our algorithm is to start out by picking some random slope w, use that to predict an output y for every x and calculate the cost associated with that. Then we calculate the gradient and see which direction we have to move in parameter space and then we update the model and repeat the process of prediction and calculating costs. I use a proportionality constant here for the change in the weights because there's uh, another parameter we have called alpha which is what is called the learning rate. So the learning rate determines the size of the step. So if you take a look at this cost function here versus x, you see that you could move from here all the way down close to the bottom, but you won't be quite at the bottom, so your next step will also be large and you can end up bouncing back and forth along your cost curve infinitely and never actually converge to a minimum. If it's too low, then you're going to take many, many small steps and it's going to take far too long to converge. So you have to pick a pretty intelligent value of alpha from the start to get a reasonable A convergence time and B uh, actual convergence. In principle, alpha is something on the order of 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3. It should be some small number. Obviously, if you pick it to be a million, your steps in parameter space are going to be huge, and you'll never converge. As I said, linear regression is useful when you want to predict continuous variables such as stock prices, home prices, car prices. And the cost function is going to be proportional to the sum of the squares of the difference between the model output and your training data. You then use what's called gradient descent to make steps in parameter space to minimize that cost, and you have to be careful when choosing the learning rate. There's another type of regression called logistic regression. 
and here we're going to predict what class some input data belongs to. Since we're dealing with classes, the output is going to be discrete, say either a 0 or a 1. And to model this mathematically, we use what is called the sigma function. I've plotted that here in the bottom left. If you've seen my tutorial series on coding a neural network, this should be familiar to you. The sigmoid function is just 1 over 1 plus e to the minus z. And this is a function that takes on uh, continuous variables, uh, continuous values between 0 and 1, depending on the value of z. And of course, when we're dealing with logistic regression, z is just our model output or the weight matrix transpose times the values x. We also have a cost function, but we doesn't make sense to use the residual sum of squares in this case. Here, and I'm not going to derive it, but this is kind of just a given for logistic regression that you use the, f the cost function of the following form. And it's proportional to the logarithm of this sigmoid function of z and the uh, model outputs y. Sorry, excuse me, the uh, actual ground truth, ground <laughs> the actual uh, classes of your training data. So if y is actually 1, meaning that your training data is of class 1, we have the blue line, and 5z is just your model output. So if the training, lab the training data is actually 1 and your model output's a value of 1, you have a very low cost. Whereas if your output is actually 1 and your model predicts that it is 0, you want to penalize that heavily. Conversely, if your training data is actually 0 and your model predicts a value of 0, you have no cost, but as you deviate from that cost and approach an output value of 1, the cost grows immensely. So in other words, we want to penalize the model for incorrectly guessing 1 when y is actually 0. And again, we're going to use what's called gradient descent to update our weights in parameter space. And here, if you take the derivative of this function, you'll find that you actually get something like this, where it's y minus 5z times x. And this is just for a single value. Please keep in mind that you do this for all of your training data and outputs. So this is useful when you want to predict the class of something. So for instance, if you're looking at a tumor and you want to think, you want to determine whether it is cancerous or benign, or less uh, ominously, if you're looking at an email and you want to determine whether or not it is spam. The cost function here is logarithmic rather than a polynomial, and we can also use gradient descent to update weights, although the form of the cost function of parameter space is going to be incredibly complex. It's worth noting that this can be used for more than two classes if you use something called the one versus all method. In that, case, in that case, you take all of the classes and you divide them up into two groups. Whatever, say class one, and then all of the other classes get lumped into a second group. You classify that, and then you separate out another class and classify all of the others in, as the separate class and continue in a round robin sort of method. Related to logistic regression is the ever popular neural network. Here we take our input data and transform it into a column vector. And we do this because um, the neural network is an actual mathematical model of how we think neurons in the brain work. Each unit of that input data is weighted and fed into an activation function, which just so happens to be the sigmoid function from the logistic regression. And then the output of that activation function is then the input of the next layer of the model. And you simply feed this data forward through the model until you get an output. A graphical representation of this is here, where we have our input layer on the left. That is just, in this case, our training data, let's say. And then each neuron of the input layer is connected to every neuron of the hidden layer through a weight matrix. And similarly, for the two hidden layers, they are also connected to each other as well as to the output layer. So this is what's called a deep network because we have two hidden layers. In practice, you will have many hidden layers. There's no real restriction on the number you can have. It's simply a matter of computational complexity.
and the number of neurons within a layer uh, can also be quite large. In our tutorial series on constructing a neural network from scratch, I believe we opted for 75 units in each layer, two hidden layers, and one input and one output layer. So here, the steps for the algorithm are to construct the input vector from your training data. Step two is to multiply the weight matrix by the input column vector. So you basically perform this operation here and apply the activation function to get your first hidden layer. And then repeat this process for the second hidden layer until you get to the output. Similar to the case of linear and logistic regression, you want to associate a cost with the deviation from the actual ground state truth of your training data. Here's a plot of a fairly simple, quote unquote simple, cost function in a two-dimensional parameter space, and you can see it is filled with peaks, valleys, and is generally a highly contoured function. In practice, we'll use the same cost function as in log logistic regression, and that's what gives you this complex shape here. However, unlike the case of logistic regression, in neural networks we don't use gradient descent. We use what is called backpropagation. And this is kind of a phrase that means that you feed the forward, you feed forward the model in one case to get the output. And then you calculate the error at that output label layer. So if your model is predicting that an image is of a dog but it's actually a cat, that is a high error. You then propagate that error backward into the second hidden layer and then back into the first layer. If you'd like to see how this is done in practice, check out my tutorial series on coding a neural network from scratch. Here we're just going to give you a conceptual overview. The reason you do this is because it is significantly more inexpensive in terms of the computations required. That's because if you start from the right side of the model, you are um, if, you, if you're starting from, ah, I have this backwards, so if you're starting from the right you are ending up with the matrix multiplication of a vector and a matrix which gives you another vector and that's much cheaper to compute uh, for each layer rather than starting from the left and moving right and getting two matrices multiplied which will give you a matrix. These are extremely powerful tools yet they're somewhat of a black box. Currently it's not completely understood how they function. And they also require immense horsepower to perform the training, although predictions using them are relatively inexpensive. Currently these are the state of the art and virtually everyone is looking at deep learning for applications in everything from understanding language to understanding images for, for self-driving cars. To recap, when you, when you have known training data, you should think of using supervised learning. And you can use that to predict both continuous and discrete outputs, and it works by associating a cost with deviation from that training data. And then you can navigate that cost function and parameter space to find its minimum and to find the best fit to your data. Now, I hadn't talked about it before, but there are some problems with supervised learning. It may seem like it's all powerful simply because all you have to do, you may think, is to feed in enough data and plop out something useful. And that is mostly true, but there are some limitations. So for instance, with enough parameters you can fit an elephant, right? What this means is that given enough parameters you can fit any mathematical function. But the problem is that when you overfit to the data, your model does not generalize well. What that means in practice is if the model performs perfectly on all of your training data, it may not necessarily correctly predict a new unseen case. Conversely, underfit models neither generalize well nor perform well on your training data. This is what is known as the bias and variance trade-off, which is a trade-off between underfitting and overfitting. The one main technique used to fit this to fix this is something called regularization. And this is where you add a term to your cost function that's proportional to the weights and some constant. And the magnitude of that constant determines the penalty you associate 
with overfitting to the data. So by picking arbitrarily large number of parameters, you end up adding in a significant cost to your model. And we didn't touch on this because it's somewhat of a detail and it's something you incorporate when you end up doing actual computations. So that's it in a nutshell. Supervised learning is not all powerful. It has some limitations because you end up overfitting data which does not generalize well. Main categories include linear regression where you're trying to predict continuous variables, logistic regression where you're trying to fit uh, discrete variables with known classes, and then neural networks which are useful in a wide variety of circumstances that uses a similar function, cost function, to the logistic regression. I hope this has been helpful. In further parts, we'll explore unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. Stay tuned. If you found the content useful, hit the thumbs up button and the subscribe button, and I'll see all of you in the next video.